Hello and welcome to the latest Science of Sport podcast. I'm your host Matt Solomon and today I'm delighted to be joined by Pete Sim. So Pete is a physical preparation coach with the England men's test cricket team and that means he's a perfect person today to discuss how elite level cricketers improve their physical performance. So without further ado, it's time to welcome Pete onto the show. So Pete, welcome to the Science of Sport podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, mate. Pleasure, pleasure to be on. Thanks for the invite. Oh, pleasure's all mine. So, can you give us a quick introduction as to who you are and what you've been up to until now? Uh, so, my name's Pete Sim. Um, I'm the strength and conditioning coach for the England men's test cricket team currently. Uh, I've been doing that role for just over about 18 months now, actually. Um, so, kind of looking after specifically the test team. We had a bit of a split a couple of years ago. Um, then, my ball to make it more manageable, and it's working really well. So, uh, now we're doing a period of um, downtime between we got back from India in the Feb, well, beginning of March, and then we don't start up again until mid July. So just kind of getting around the players, working with them remotely, or working with some long term rehabs at the moment. So quite Excellent. different okay. role in that sense from in series. Can you explain for the people who aren't familiar with cricket what red ball and white ball is? Because sorry, yes. yeah, I, I imagine there's some people who are listening. Like I want to hear about this, but also what's going on. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, so we have in cricket there's three formats. Um, the one played with a red ball, um, which responds a bit differently. I'm not going to get into technical stuff with it, but it, 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 the, it, it creates different facets of the game. But it's less multi day cricket, so um, which we call international level, it's called test cricket, which is over five days. And at domestic level, it's um, four day cricket. Um, but the game is essentially the same domestic and, and international. It's just that extra day, basically, to make sure we get results. And then the other two formats, you have 50 over cricket, um, which is based over with one day. It takes the whole day, um, which is a bit shorter. It kind of bridges the gap between the two, and that's played with a white ball. And then there's T20 cricket, which is 20 over each side, which lasts about three, three and a bit hours. Um, and that's the shortest format of the game um, at international level. So we have you have different styles of player for it. It's getting more and more that we have specialist players for each format, or certainly the short form and then long form. But then there are a few guys that sit in the middle that kind of play across all formats that have got the kind of skill set to play across all of them. I think we'll, we'll get into the, the low demands of that later because I think it's super interesting to, yeah, to, to hear your perspective on how players can kind of cross those those different forms yeah. while also then having to effectively play all of the time. Uh, but we'll get onto that in a second. Before before we do, what are the demands of, of test cricket? So you said five, four to five days. Um, Americans are going to be tearing their hair out because you can draw after five days and they can't deal with that. But like, you've got such a long period of play, but during that, not everyone's playing, right? So w- what are the physical demands when you're playing test cricket? So they can... The trouble with it is it, it it really varies from game to game because the game can last three days or it can go all five days, so it makes it very difficult to predict what's going to happen. And then obviously you prepare them for something that you don't know what the demand is, as opposed to where it originally started. You kind of knew within a bandwidth what you were preparing them for each week. Again, it changes slightly, but you could then and then you could plan out every week based going forward based on you knew what you were getting each Saturday effectively. Whereas cricket's a bit different, but I'll kind of read out a few some stats that are getting these sort of averages, or and they can get worse, uh, you know, higher than these loads. But cover across um, a five day. This is the stats literally from the most recent tour um, for one of the players was fifty five k total different total distance over a game, five k that between twenty and twenty five kilometers an hour, so decent high speed running. Um, a bit that can go up to you know seven k plus. Um, 230 deliveries, so uh, 230 balls that, that play a ball in this game, um, and that's eight times body weight going through his front foot, at, at, at front foot contact. So that's 230 times that, like a maximal deceleration, rotation, flexion. Um, plus, you he's running it. The average run-up speed for this player would be about 24 kilometers an hour. So, you know, decent, decent intensity there. Um, and then for the batters, you're looking at about. 35 kilometers in the field over a total distance, um, 50 max effort excels in there, uh, 300 meters plus of sprinting. And then for a batter, the might have to do that and then go out 
and then and obviously then back. Um, and a hundred runs accounts accounts to about ten kilometers total distance, obviously between the wickets. So accelerating, decelerating. Um, granted, some of that can be just trotting through, and then but you're going to have some access cells in there. And then that was from this recent tour. So that's in that particular game was actually thirty five degrees heat in India. So it's you know it's a long time out there. They're spending seventeen hours out in the field over over the course of the the game, and then that's five tests within five matches within two months nine flights in there four and a half hours time difference in that where that game was it was 35 degrees where we played the last game it was eight degrees because we were up north so like really like vastly changing temperatures which then makes it difficult to prepare them for that because you you know it you're going from super hot conditions to super cold conditions within one game to the next so i say super cold eight degrees eight degrees is really cold for cricket um, <laughs> yeah. and then within that there was two three day turnarounds so you're doing 55k you've got three days turnaround with a flight involved and then you're going again for another 55k so the demands are really high particularly on the bowlers the batters can get away with it a bit you know they've got some really like quite a lot of low intensity demand but it's still a lot of time on feet um so yeah that's that's probably a good summary of kind of demands of, of on the players. And how does it differ then? How does it differ between uh, batting and bowling? Because obviously, at some point, uh, you've got two two people on the field, and <clears throat> the rest are pretty much sat there eating cucumber sandwiches. Um, and the the team that's fielding, they obviously got yeah, all but one of their players uh, on the field ready to go, right? Yeah. So obviously, during when we're when the team's batting there's obviously only two people out there so the other guys are resting up but often if you've bowled first it's that's your recovery window so you're hoping your team bats for a long time one so they get a lot of runs but two so the bowlers can get their put their feet up and actually that's your recovery day even though it's within game that is your that's your recovery window um again that can be if you don't the bats don't perform particularly well then you could be back out there having to bowl within half a day after having spent a day your feet so yes there is a lot of like sitting around but sometimes we relish that because that's your recovery that's the opportunity to recover even for the batters if they've been fielding for a long period of time they then they still need that recovery window so and that's where in game we get a lot of kind of recovery work done so our ice baths being fire whatnot which i can come on to later on oh absolutely that'd be that'd be super interesting but uh, when when we touched earlier on the the demands uh throughout the year so how how does that look uh, when it comes to, you mentioned like a, a two month window where you play five tests, but are there players that then do this all year? Or yeah, like like you said, if you're if you're only playing the test games, then in, in the summer you'll have another series of test matches and it's kind of spread out. How, how does that look for different players? Yeah, so I mean, it's getting more and more congested now because we have the, the, the domestic competitions are becoming really lucrative now. So players, even though they're contracted to England, Will then in the time between England series, will then go and play up in franchise tournaments because um, they can make you know millions of pounds in between on top of their, their contract. So one, they might need a rest, but also it's hard to turn down a million quid if you're being offered it for say to go to the <laughs> IPL. Um, so that makes it really difficult from a workload management point of view and from you know physically and, uh, and mentally. Um, so it's, and that's only getting more and more, um, you know, more and more tournaments are popping up. So the guys are getting they're kind of more and more stressed, albeit sometimes it's their decision to do that. However, we are seeing a bit of a change that some more high profile players um, pulling themselves out of tournaments to then to allow them to, because it's, an amazing, it's a really evolving field. This so players have kind of done it, overdone it, having to then realize actually it's not sustainable and they're now starting to work out. I need to pick and choose what I do and don't play in. So that's a really emerging space for the guys that play all format. What we do have is the what I kind of alluded to earlier, the guys that just play test cricket or just play multi-day cricket. It's actually a lot easier uh, for them to manage their time because they don't have all the, a lot of these lucrative tournaments. So a lot of them are the T20 franchise tournaments. So if they haven't got that skill set, they're only really focusing on the test series and they become, I don't know, nice and they're kind of spaced out quite nicely so there are those periods of regeneration and that's my opportunity to 
when they're at home, go in and work with them, use them as a physical training block to then prepare them for the next series. Um, but I'll also come home and play domestic cricket as well for their counties. Um, but because they're centrally contracted, we can kind of influence what they do and don't play, play in. So it allows them to, it's a lot easier to manage their time with that. So yeah, so sounds, it's, sounds positive. It's tricky, that you yeah, can manage that. It's tricky with the multi form with the full multi format players because it's just getting more and more. Their their loads are just going through the roof. Um, for example, we've got one player that's just spent six out of the last seven months in India because he played in the World Cup, then played in the Test series with us, then played in the IPL. So it's you know it's it's a long time to 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 spend that away from home in in a, in a foreign country, I suppose. Uh, absolutely, and. When when players are in those positions, let's say they, they do spend six, seven months away, um, what are the kind of injuries that they're picking up? Because obviously at some point, you can't just keep doing high loads and high intensities all the time. Yeah, so they, they, they vary. I mean, we get the your usual soft tissue, um, soft tissue injuries, your calves, hamstrings, groins, quads. Um, but there's, there's not really any major prevalent ones, certainly international. Some of the stats have showed that across the county, the domestic county game, hamstring injuries have been a kind of the biggest soft tissue time loss injury, um, as they are across you know a lot of invading game sports and things. Um, and then the one, a big key time loss one would be lumbar stress fractures um, in cricket, in, particularly in your fast bowlers. You get it a little bit in your, your some spinners, um, but not so much in your batters, obviously. Um, and that's kind of the one big area. It's a bit, it's the ACL of cricket, I suppose. Um, big time loss, quite prevalent. Um, so we're putting some a lot of work into to kind of how we can reduce the risk of that. It's the biggest, the biggest risk is the guys that are kind of eighteen to to twenty three. Um, you, the, the, that's what the stats are showing us. But we're doing some work on. We we need to have a lot more to to do to understand it across the game. How we prevent or how we reduce the risk but workload is obviously key to that bowler workload um and part of the challenge with that is that there's multiple stakeholders involved that all want them to play for their team again if it's franchise or whether it's county cricket or whether it's domestic uh, international cricket so how we manage the stakeholders involved is, is one of the things we're working on to get more of a consistency so without having unnecessary spikes in load um, but then a lot around lumbar pelvic control to kind of let them be able to tolerate not getting into to extension um, or certainly extension that they're not in control of because um, we we know that that's you know a key risk factor within uh, in causing lumbar stress fractures along, along with a multitude of other things and that's the trouble with it it's quite it's really complex because some of it is to do with their action um, their bowling action so it's doing load, so it's doing load. So it's kind of how we manipulate things to, to make them as robust as possible. So yeah, that they're the kind of the major ones. As with any sport, you would go pick up plenty of other injuries, but there's not there's none that kind of stand out other than your lumbar stress. And when it comes to then uh training to be kind of yeah, robust to that or or yeah, improving your your coordination and strength. What what does a gym session for a cricketer look like? Because I mean, I imagine there's some some basics going on in there, but there could be some really specific stuff going on too. So when it when it comes to professional cricket, the, the top level athlete, um, yeah, what what are they doing and how does it vary depending on their roles? Because you just mentioned two completely different injury profiles uh based on position as well. So I think I think this is in my philosophy across any whatever sport or athlete you're working with is, is what's their limit and factor to, to give them an opportunity to perform. In regards to the sport, that might be you know might be the different or might be the same. Um, so injury history or physical capacity, what you know what's holding them from being on the field. But if you want to go, I suppose specific to the sport after you've kind of assessed their injury history and physical capacity, if you want to go specific to the sport, bowlers, um, yeah, I mean. Again, like other sports, strength is, is pretty vital within there and developing that. Um, but particularly in, in key patterns um, for their skills. So your fast bowlers are looking at a lot of unilateral work, a lot of contralateral work in, uh, in some, some key positions that kind of underpin them 
their foundation to be able to tolerate the load on the field. And then with batters, a little bit more, not solely, but a lot more bilateral work, a lot more concentric focus, producing force through the ground and, and, and away from them. So, um, and then a lot of more rotational movements. <clears throat> but I think certainly with the guys I'm working with, because we're when I'm with them a lot of the time it's we're in series, it's just getting the basics done really consistently. I think that's what's what gives us more success is just doing it really consistently as opposed to doing anything particularly fancy and specific because we're we're often we're in series or we're building up to a series. Um so can we just give them regular exposures? So that's where microdosing is really, really useful for those guys. Just um jumping in for thirty minutes here and there. Uh, either day before or dur- often during the game. Like I say, we've got those opportunities where we've, if we're batting really for long periods of time, the bowlers can get a little strength to hit top up. Or if it rains, we're not playing the rain in cricket, thankfully. Um, so we, we use those opportunities to kind of to get the there's a window to to get a microdose of strength hitting. So I think yeah, biggest thing is is consistency of of strength exposure. Um, for, for the guys I'm working with. And what might one of those microdosing sessions look like? Because I imagine for, for different sports and different situations, it's, it varies. But yeah, for, for you guys, if you're, let's say you're in, uh, in-game, in I'm, I'm not sure whether there are many sports in the world which have in-game microdosing. Um, so what, what does a session like that look like, which obviously you can't destroy them in because they've got to go out into the field at any given point in the next hours? But also they need to get a stimulus. So how how do you build that up? And we, um, my message for them is always you can keep the intensity high and we just reduce the volume. So we're looking at often two supersets, two sets on each superset, um, or even occasionally you know one superset and let's just do it really well. You know we'll be in and out in fifteen minutes, but that's we're getting. We know we can get a decent you know stimulus from that. And if we're doing that regularly, then that'll be enough. To, to keep us ticking over, especially in series, or because we're not we're not looking to develop it in series. If if they do, brilliant. But you know, we're we're just trying to get them from one game to the next and stop them going backwards, um, so they can still be where they are at the start at the end of the series is where they were at the start. So yeah, keeping the volume as well, keeping the intensity kind of as normal for them, and they they tolerate that pretty well. Again, and not everyone does that. This is not all the players in the team doing this. We have you know guys that are really compliant to it and guys that aren't compliant to it so I don't want to make it out like yeah all the fast bowlers jump in and they love it <laughs> we've, but we've got some guys get, get, get pretty good at it and they, because they're used to it and they've had some good experiences with it um, and had some success with it then, then we go with it anyway. and I'm rudely interrupting to make sure that you're up to date and aware of the Science of Sport Coach Academy the Coach Academy is an overgrowing library of sports science courses which are broken down into bite-sized chunks so if you're enjoying today's podcast and you want to get your hands on some more great sports science information, when the show's finished, get into the show notes where you can get into the Science Support Coach Academy completely for free for the next seven days. So hit that link in just a few minutes' time. And what kind of exercise are we talking about? So two, two supersets, is that an upper and a lower body superset? Is it an upper, lower, upper, lower? How, how does that look? Yeah, generally, so a posterior chain, lower body, and a, and a posterior chain, upper body, anterior um, on lower body anterior upper body really and then often with a little bit of trunk in there or try and incorporate that within within the exercise so a bulgarian with a dumbbell overhead and just to increase some uh, some trunk trunk activation and, and trunk strength exposure within, within that again working for bang for buck time and and cost energy cost wise so um if we can you know tick more boxes with the one exercise then we will um, but nothing particularly, you know, again, when I say basics done well, it, a lot of it is, you know, your standard, it'll be a bulldog, it'll be a split squat, it'll be an RDL, um, and then it'll be a, a landmine press or, or a chin, you know, nothing too fancy, especially within those micro sessions, because we're just looking to get a, an exposure in a, st- a stimulus as opposed to building any sort of development or uh, strength. And and how often are you doing those sessions? Because you you mentioned like a, a two month period, which could be maintenance in that in that case. Um, how often do they need to perform these sessions to to maintain their their strength levels? 
So, I mean, we look for a minimum of, of once a week, one strength, decent strength exposure once a, uh, once a week. If it's really micro, you know, those in-game, those in-game ones are kind of a luxury. So we, we would like to get a proper strength session exposure in and then that would be like a top up where we got it. Um, so yeah, in series, we're, you know, once every seven days is optimal, is, you know, enough. Um, again, the, the research shows us that strength decay is, is, is longer than that. So we can, you know, we can maintain levels with that. And we've seen that within our players. If they, can, if they do that once a week, every seven to 10 days, then they can maintain their strength levels. Um, and the, the, the schedules generally lead, allow for that as well. Because the maps we'll ever have is a three day turnaround. So we can still always within that, those three days get some sort of hit in. Um, and then often the game will finish within four days, so it gives us an extra day. Um, so yeah, once once a week, twice if we're if we're lucky um, within series, and then often within within a series there'll be two, like a week break, and that's your opportunity to to get a couple more in. Um, again, just to top those that, those maintenance levels up, I suppose, to stop the strength decay. Awesome. So when when you then start to monitor what happens during those um, those games, you mentioned earlier some statistics, but what what are you measuring, and what's the role of of monitoring in terms of improving performance? So we we again we don't do anything at present, and it's something that we can definitely get anything super super high level in terms of science. But what we do do consistently and do well is work in track. All the workloads, literally in numbers of crudely in numbers of overs, and then use an acute point ratio to help guide decision making. But again, but it, it's very much a piece of the puzzle that we we very much rely on the players and the coaching staff to use their own intuition around building a plan for their loads going into a series and then how they manage within series. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, it's so varying depending on the game. You can't predict what's going to happen, so you're very much making decisions post game on the fly. So depending on how they've pulled up from the previous game. And a lot of that is informal dialogue. Almost like you you have a formal wellness questionnaire, but you're doing it face to face, you know, you know. And then that dictates what they might their their load for, for whatever training sessions coming up. Um, we do use GPS. Um, the catapult have a within their GPS units have an algorithm that can detect every ball. Um, Give you um, max velocity delivery, max velocity two seconds prior to delivery, and then peak rotation player load. So it's quite an idea like the four main metrics that we we kind of will use, and that helps as monitor intensity within bowling from a run up perspective. Again, it's a piece of the puzzle because it doesn't it literally tells us the max velocity run up, but that doesn't mean that you know their bowling speed was, the intensity was staying where it was. So we'll use that in conjunction with ball velocity to, to uh, monitor intensity within training and then see how far they are from game. What we do see is that bowlers can never get, uh, with the highest they can get is about, 90, about 95%, as in, in terms of how, how close they can get to match intensity within training, regardless of the instruction or, or their effort. They never seem to be able to match that in terms of speed and ball velocity. Um, and then we also use it to measure max V, Max velocity exposure. Um, again, it usually we'll always sprint day before the game, so it just uses that as a bit of a tick box to make sure we're actually getting the stimulus that we're that we're after within those um, sprint sessions. And then we also use um, heart rate monitoring um, mainly for um, training intensity prescription. So I'll use it not within training sessions in skill sessions but within conditioning sessions just to guide in players intensities it helps them really self-regulate their own intensity so i'll set them off with a heart rate monitor or the watch on or use the, the kind of the polar beat app and be like i want 12 minutes um red zone exposure you've got whatever the interval session is make sure you're running intensity if it's hitting that and it really allows the lads to then work out what sort of speeds and what paces allow them to to get that exposure so it's been really useful when i'm with them but also working remotely with them because we do a lot of, I, do, I do a lot of remote work with them i can program uh, red zone minutes or when we're doing longer slower stuff 
kind of zone two efforts and staying within that that allows them to just really regulate their intensity. It's, you know, you get with athletes, you give them a session, they're quite fast or and you know, well, it's very difficult to kind of, to program that. So it allows you then to kind of go, and then obviously allow for your daily fluctuations of fatigue and whatnot, they might just have to run slower on a certain day. Um, so that's really useful and something I want to, doing that with a few players at the moment, I'd like to do it with more. Um, so that's kind of an avenue where I want to push a bit harder. Excellent stuff. That's so, from a monitoring perspective, really, yeah. And when, when we bring all of that together, um, <clears throat> can you talk us through what a, a week looks like when athletes are on tour? So let's say you're, uh, you've got your, your five-day test match. Um, let's say, <clears throat> for, for E's sake, I know it doesn't normally happen like this, but let's, for E's sake, say it starts on Monday. Um, and you go through till Sunday. You've got five days, Monday to Friday, and then two rest days. Um, can you talk us through what happens on those days and what those days look like from a, a performance standpoint? Yeah. So it, it can be really varied depending on the previous game, particularly how the game went. So if the if we went well, often we batted for a long period of time, they didn't have to bowl them out quickly. So their workloads would be quite low. So that allows that, that three-day kind of build into the... So we usually have a three-day build into a game. It allows to training window if the game went badly and we were in the field for a long period of time bowling, obviously the guys are coming in really fatigued so that has a really big impact on what we do in those three days so they generally have a plan for both scenarios and then we'll adjust on the fly depending on that and again within that you might have even though you might have bowlers that did more than other bowlers within that game so you, you know for various reasons so that then dict you know it might be a high day for somebody else and a low day for another so that you just have to be kind of very clear on what they did the previous week. But you can't kind of standard, say they were going in fresh, we would have your three-day lead into a test match on day one because they're fresh, we'd sprint. And we'd use that as an opportunity to, to get our max velocity exposure, um, knowing that they'll, they'll, they'll like you to get one in the game as well. So we know we get two exposures within that week. Um, they would have a moderate ball, so, you know, get a decent amount of, um, bowling right into their belt, and that would look like six to eight overs, um, six balls being an over. Sorry, I haven't really clarified that for listeners that don't, uh, don't know. It's six balls within an over, that's what I talk about. And then day two, you would look at an easier bowl, so just a little top up, so four overs. And then you often tag on an aerobic top up onto, onto that, um, so that would either be a tempo run um, for. I'll quickly, slight tangent, but we have Phil Scott. I don't know if you ever come across him. Was the um, I followed on from him in the test team. He did some good work around um, aerobically profiling our players, uh, what they respond well to, um, using anaerobic speed reserve and um, AMS. And we have our guys that are kind of respond better to. Um, faster aerobic work, so your tempo, so generally you kind of speed athletes that will do more tempo work and the guys that are your, your chuggers that, you look, that respond better to your, to your longer aerobic efforts, they will do more of that. So it allows them to make get the same sort of aerobic stimulus, but from really contrasting different uh, methods. So they either do a tempo run or they'll do a, long, uh, like a longer um, three, four minute aerobic effort, two minutes recovery, um, top up off the back of their bowling. And then another strength session, so we'll get our strength fit on day two, so two days out from the game. And then day three, um, some guys, this isn't everyone, but some guys will do a, a primer lift. So we're looking at three exercises, two sets, and hit it across the force velocity curve, really. So we'll do something really explosive, something relatively heavy, um, and then something in between. Um, so we're just getting a different exposure across, across that curve. And then day four is your, your day one of the game so it's that that's, that would be like the general lead in if they were coming in uncompromised I suppose and, and you mentioned earlier some different recovery techniques uh for during the game what, what does that look like when you're trying to get yeah as much recovery as possible during the the short breaks that you do have so well first and foremost nutrition within game is key because we're obviously recovering but we're also we're trying to fuel we fuel um, to go again very, very soon. And that's a bit of space that's been really worked on in cricket and it's in international cricket, certainly, and it's in, certainly in 
getting better in the domestic game. Um, it's players understanding the education field and also the resource we actually commit to to driving that. Um, and then on top of that, ice pass. The lads really enjoy the ice pass actually. I know this can be a controversial topic for a lot of players, a lot of players in sports, but. The, yeah, the boys seem to really enjoy them. So we have that every hour. We have an ice bath we take to the hotel um, with us, and we also have one every ground, each ground. And then we started to use on and off um, the blood flow restriction hydro shorts, um, both passively and actively. Again, only a couple of players, not everyone, but um, we have started to, to use that in something that like, I want to kind of trying to drive a little bit more going forward um, to, to really, even if it's a small win, it's still a small, um, moves the needle a little bit. I think it's worth doing because it's so simple and so easy. Um, so that's another thing we, we use both in-game and, and post-game. And then we also recently, on the, the most recent tour, took a performance chef with us to India which has been a bit of a game changer in my eyes and not just not just having good quality food available um to to fuel and recover but the lads really trust it especially when we're in the subcontinent that historically lads get ill um and then they stick to stuff that's really safe which is pizza and pasta because that's familiar to them whereas lads are actually now they will eat whatever the chef puts out man because it's high quality um, I think that's been a big, a big win for us in uh, recovery and refueling. I, I've heard stories as well from uh, from different sports where, <clears throat> especially uh, in India, there could be uh, some dodgy tummies the next day when you've uh, when you've just arrived there, and that's not exactly a helping performance. But uh, it sounds like you guys have, have combated that quite well. Yeah, the guys are familiar with India. I mean, uh, cricket in India is 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 so big that they'd spent years and years touring there. Uh, the, the majority of them so they're they're very aware of it so they were living having chef there so they can move away from just eating the pasta and plain pasta and plain pizza yeah um, i can imagine mate i yeah. can imagine um excellent pete so uh that's that's it in terms of uh time and we've we've already uh stolen a little bit too much of it from you but uh where can people find more about you and what you're up to um so i'm not brilliant at kind of uh, Self well, not self promoting because that makes it sound bad on the people that do self promote. Um, I don't have any you know, um, <laughs> private business in my hand. I have uh, in my Instagram, his handle is petersim13. Uh, um, and I do share kind of little bits and bobs that we do on tour, uh, a lot of golf content if anyone's interested. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, uh, mate. So, uh, that's it. Thanks very much, then. I, I really appreciate it and I look forward to speaking again soon. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks, mate. And that's it. Once again, a massive thanks to Pete for all of his hard work on today's podcast. I really enjoyed it, and I hope you did at home too. Before you leave, I want to point you in the direction of the Science Sport Coach Academy. And the Coach Academy is an overgrowing library of sports science courses, which are broken down into bite-sized chunks. So if you've enjoyed today's podcast and you want to get your hands on some more great sports science information, you can get into the Coach Academy completely for free using the link in the show notes for the next seven days. And... What's more, every time you complete one of the courses, you get a certificate of completion, which will prove your ongoing education. And if you have enjoyed today's podcast, it would be fantastic if you could recommend us to a coach, a colleague, an athlete, or a friend. That means that we can keep bringing the best possible guests and best possible content. And that's it. Once again, I'm Matt Solon of Science Sport, and I'll speak to you next week.